let us continue to worship the Lord as we uh, dive into his word. We'll be looking at Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25. But before we do that, let's go ahead and go before the Lord in prayer. Oh Lord, we do come before you this morning. We do thank you for your word and the truths that are in it. I pray that you would give me the words this morning and that would point people to you. I pray that those that are here would have ears to hear. Oh Lord, that as we look at these great truths of Scripture, that we would be not only hearers of them, but, but that we would be doers of them, that we would really have a changed life and how we live out the principles that are here, Lord. And Lord, I know that I can't do it. I know that everybody here can't do that, live this out without your enablement, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray that the, that the Holy Spirit within us, the guarantee that we have that we are yours would just work within us and that we could be a gospel community that lives out your word. In your name we do pray. Amen. So today, like I've been mentioning, we are here in Matthew chapter 6. And it's interesting as you think about our, our time here in, in God's Word, we really have been spending a couple months on these two chapters. I mean, we've just kind of been crawling along. And I know of an individual that had gone ahead and had gone through the Sermon on the Mountain and said, all right, he wanted to do it because it was given in one setting. They went ahead and give it, gave it on, on one Sunday. Um, I'm afraid if I had to give it just a message on the Sermon on the Mount on one Sunday, it would probably go into the next Sunday because there's just so much rich information here and so applicable to life in so many ways. And in fact, as we dive into it this morning, we it, it starts off with a command. In fact, this command is given five times in this short little passage. And so that's the clear, obvious uh main point of this passage, and yet each and every one of us knows that we have struggled with this at some point in time, as well as we will continue to struggle with it, even though we desire not to. And in another sense, today's sermon is a just a continuation of last week, but the opposite side of the coin, so to speak, as we talk about money. And I'll kind of flesh that out a little bit more. But as we get into it, um, really, it, it, we are called not to be anxious. It says, do not be anxious. And we'll look and we'll look at some other scriptures. Right now, it's going to be, we're going to primarily focus on financial and provisions that we need for everyday life. Now, if I were to ask each and every one of you, how many of you have been anxious at some point in time in your life for just kind of the basic things that you need in life? Uh, and so I'm not just saying just money, but just, just the next thing that you need. How many of you would say, yes, I have been anxious? I think each and every one could go ahead and raise their hand and says, yes, I have been anxious in life. And I have not only been anxious just for a little bit, for an extended period of time, and some people probably here have lost sleep over just what's going to happen. And for a lot of people, maybe if you, you're in a job transition or you've lost a job or just so many other things, there's this opportunity to be anxious. And it really, um, I'll just kind of hit you real hard with it. It's an indicator, your anxiety is an indicator of self-centeredness and unbelief. Now, if you think about that, 
Why is that just kind of the, the root of when we think about anxiety? Because when we're anxious about something, we're typically anxious about how, how am I going to make it? How am I going to deal with what's ahead of me? How am I going to? And it starts about this I, I, I. And what happens? It, it puts your focus on you instead of God. And so that, that, that anxiety that builds up, it, again, it's the same trick that Satan used is over and over and over again. If you turn back and you, and you, and you look at Genesis 1 and, and you t- look at Adam and Eve and uh, there they are in the garden, what does Satan talk to Eve about? Does God really have the best plan for your life? Does he really care for you? And this is the same thing that Satan spends again and again and again. I mean, you can even look at in uh, the wilderness with Jesus. He tries to tempt Jesus with this. Does your father really have the best plan for your life? Are you really going to be provided for? And so, again, it takes our eyes off Jesus, it takes our eyes off God, who is a good Father, who provides for us abundantly more than we can fathom, and we buy into the lie that He really can't deal with this in our lives. And we forget that not only could He deal with this, He's created all things. He is all-knowing, He is all-powerful, and and He is right there, and He cares for you. So, right off, we'll kind of get this idea of don't be anxious. It's a command. It's it's an imperative saying, don't be this way. And and I hope, like like, uh, most of you, um, when we looked at it last week, it said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. I hope you saw that as a command and you go, I'm not going to do that. So how this is the same side or or the different side of the same coin is, I I think in this last week as we talked about not laying up uh, treasures uh, on earth but laying them up in heaven, and that idea of being generous, giving, saying, all right, God has called me to be, to be generous in so many ways, and this is how I'm going to gener- be generous. And it says, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a, a blindness of the eyes that a lot of times we don't see that our struggles with not being generous is, is really against God because he talks about it, your, your, your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is unhealthy, and, and if you're not kind of giving and being generous, but you know that you've been given from the Lord and, and you really don't own any of it anyway, then, then you're in sin. And so on the other side, thinking about those that have the tendency to store things up are those that tend to have financial resources. But on the other side of it, kind of what we're looking at, those that are wondering, where is my food going to come from? Where are my clothes going to come from? In one sense, it's I don't have the financial resources and I'm worried for where they're going to come. And so it's still a, a concern about finances and money, but it's the opposite side of, all right, I'm not sure they're going to be there. So anxiety wells up. And, it's, and then, again, you, and I'll look at this real quickly, you can't serve two masters. You're either going to serve God or serve money. And just as, it's either one way or the other. You can't. You can't do both. It's impossible for you to do both. So, again, this just really hits to the core of it when we realize, all right, I'm anxious about these things. Just put in your mind, I am being self-centered. I'm not really looking to God to be my provider. And the tendency is to jump in and try to do it yourself. And not only that, you start to create idols within your life that you say, this is more important than God. And that's kind of what we looked at last week is, 
uh, the issue of idolatry with, with money becoming that idol and, and, and not trusting God. And so, again, it's kind of the, the same topic, but kind of from a different perspective. George Mueller had this to say about um, anxiety. The beginning of anxiety is the end of faith, and the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. Because the moment we are in that situation that we start to feel anxious, go, all right, how is this going to happen? How is it going to be done? We take our eyes off what God says. He says, I am a good father. I'm here. Trust in me. Believe in me. And so I, I think this quote just says it really good. So if you're not there, have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. And again, it's kind of, I'm going to have to jump around a little bit right here in the first because it starts off with therefore. Therefore is connecting what we had talked and preached about last week. But I think more particularly, it's looking at verse 24 where it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the, money, uh, the other. You cannot serve God in money. So he's just expounding upon this when, he, when he's saying, Therefore I tell you, saying, Pay attention, watch out, this is a trap, this is a snare. Don't fall into this snare of, that you would be anxious. It says, do not be anxious about your life. So in one sense it says, don't be anxious in, in any area of your life. This is a command that I have for you not to be anxious. Now, we know this truth of scriptures right here. And we all know that we've violated it, right? How many of you have been anxious about something? And then your spouse comes alongside of you and says, I don't worry about it. What's typically your response? Oh, you're absolutely right. I'm not going to worry about it anymore. And then that's the end of it. It's out of your mind and you haven't thought, you don't think about it since. No, you're like, no, but if you understood the real difficulties that I have here, you should be anxious like I am. You should be going into sin like me. Okay, you wouldn't say that part. But you try to draw them in. Because it's such a big concern on your mind. And, and you don't go, how can anybody treat it so cavalier? And God says, all right. Understand who I am. This is my command for you. And again, I'm not just going to leave it with it here. I'll, I'll take you a couple other places where it says not to be anxious. And, and just to assure you that this is God's command. This is a whole central point of this. Not to be anxious. And, and for some of you, you are in here right now. And you are anxious about so many things that you could fill up a whole legal pad full of them. Think about it. If you could really go ahead and, and take that and wipe that clean and say, I don't have to be anxious about that, think about how freeing that is. Because I'm going to tell you, your, your Father in Heaven cares for you. He loves you. And so they say, all right, you, this comes on the heel of you. You, you can't serve God in money. You, you, you can't do that. You're saying, don't be anxious because... You can't be anxious and be a follower of Jesus Christ. Is kind of what he's saying. He's saying, all right, th those, are, those are kind of separated. I don't want you to be in that position. I want you to follow after me. I want you to trust in me. Uh, God easily provides for us. And so we'll look at it. We'll look at he, He's going to talk about eating and drinking and what your body and what you wear. And it says this. I said, don't be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor your, or about your body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. So a lot of different things about this. If I were to look at this and go, all right, well, let's kind of 
and kind of splice this apart as, as us living in here in America, which of these do we tend to worry about? Well, I, I think a lot of times we, most people here probably aren't wondering where their next meal is going to come from. And then that kind of goes along with drinking. About your body. Now, this doesn't mean that we, we, we're just completely like, it, it's a non-issue, but it's an issue where you go, all right, God has control. If you think about it, just even to this morning, all the different requests that were made about people that are struggling with cancer. It's a concern, and I think it's right to bring that before the Lord and say, hey, Lord, I am trusting you with this. I am trusting you with this difficulty. But also, in the same mindset, I'm going to trust that the Lord is going to work this out. I don't know how, but I'm going to trust in Him. I'm going to rely upon that He has a perfect plan. And it says, what you put on. Now, again, a, a lot of times, people will go through and and for most of you, probably this morning, you went through your closet and you said, what do I have on that's green? What can I put on that has green in it? For some of you, you probably said, I'm not going to put on green because everybody else is putting on green. They're kind of that rebel. But it went through your mind and there's some people that just didn't realize today was St. Patrick's Day and, and just to, don't even care about anything that it has to do with. But... Some people go ahead and they take that to the extreme. They're so concerned about their image and what, how people are going to perceive them and, and that they're anxious, how, how they look, that, that, that it get, becomes so self-focused that they miss out that here I am and how I dress, how I look. The, the, the one qualification that is required is does it honor God? I mean, that's what you, that's the main criteria. I mean, there's it's here and there, but that's going to keep you out of a lot, of, a lot of problems. If you go, all right, open up the closet. All right, does this honor God? And if it and if and if that's not really your concern, you're concerned about so many other things. I, I just think you you go down a rabbit trail, going, I'm worried. I'm concerned. And it just, it takes your eyes off Jesus. And I know that this is probably hard to, coming from a guy standing up here that doesn't overly care necessarily how I dress. I care, but I not overly. Like, you're not going to find me wearing $100 shirts. But I know that there's great freedom and great rest in that not being overly concerned. I just wish that the 42-year-old self could go back to the high schooler self and tell himself that. But, you know, it's one of those things that we've got to watch out for is, all right, we've got to make sure that how are we honoring the Lord? And, and, and because life is about so much more. And then he goes ahead and, and, and Jesus, again, gives an argument with that which is in nature, and he does this quite a bit. And he picks on birds, and he talks about birds. And his argument with regards to all of this concerning birds, he says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And it continues on in verse 27. It says, And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? So he goes ahead, and I can just imagine Jesus out there. He's on a hill. He's seeing birds flying by, and he goes, Look at those birds. And in fact, in, in Luke, it mentions the idea of ravens, which ravens are considered unclean. And, and, and for a Jewish audience, yeah, all right, God's going to care for those unclean animals. And, and Jesus is like, yeah, Jesus cares about them. 
And you are so much more valuable. And, and it says, understand, it says, when, it, when it talks off, it says, look at the birds of the air. And, and that's, a, that's a command. That's a, another imperative command. It says, look at them. God cares and provides for them. And, and think about how much more God cares for his children. You go, well, yeah, obviously God cares for me much more than he cares for the birds of the air. And, and it's not as though the birds don't do anything. They, I mean, you, you watch birds, they're active all day long. They're there scavenging and doing all of this and that. But they're not worrying. God cares for them. God pro provides for them. And how much more uh, does God provide for us, his children? And then he goes ahead and, and, he, and he adds this kind of this little tagline. And, and whether believers or unbelievers, it has kind of been adopted. That you can't add a, a single length, a single hour to your life if you worry. Do all of us know that? Absolutely. Has anybody in here received ulcers from worrying? Gotten sick over worrying? Any of you? I know that I, I have taken years off my life. I have developed ulcers from worrying, and it's wrong. It, it, it shows an improper relationship between who I am and my Heavenly Father. Right? It, it shows that I don't think God's going to work this out that I have to worry about. It, it's taking my eyes off Jesus. It's take, putting my eyes back on myself and saying, all right, it's all about me, but yet I forget that my Heavenly Father cares so much more deeply about me than I do about myself. He cares greatly for me, and He'll have you go through hard times. He'll have you go through pain. He'll have you go through those things because He loves you. And so you have to put that going, all right, because if we're honest with ourselves, one of the, one of the biggest lies that have kind of crept into the American church is that idea of if you get sick, if you have problems, God doesn't care for you. That is a bold-faced lie. God has you go through trials and has you go through hardships because he cares for you. It's not a lack of faith that's the reason you get sick. No, it's sin in the world. And so I think today in culture, people just go ahead and assume that, hey, if, if I trust in, in God, and, and this can come from TV evangelists and other things, that if I trust in God, I'm not going to have any more problems. And in fact, that, that's a lot of times the way the gospel is presented. And, and, and it's just wrong. It's, no, you're going to have problems. And so scripture even says, not only are you, you going to have problems, you're probably going to have more problems after you trust in Jesus. But I'm there with you. I care about you so deeply and I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. And when you're going through those hard times, you can trust in me. That's the gospel. So, so he gives the example of the birds. And, and again, next time you start worrying, go off. Take some time to pray, pray. Enjoy the beautiful scenery that's around us. And then when you see a bird... Remind yourself, God cares for them. How much more he cares for me. I should not be anxious. Because I know that God cares for them. And he cares for me much in a much greater way. 
So, he goes ahead and he, he gives the example of birds. After he gives the example of birds, he, he kind of gives that example of uh, not adding a little bit of time to your life. And he, and he jumps quickly to there and says, all right, you're not believing me yet. Let me give you another example. Let me give you an example of the lilies of the field. And so in verse 28, it says this. It says, and why are you anxious about clothing? Understand that clothing, clothing is different in that time. Most people back then probably had what they wore and then maybe some uh, blankets or something like that. They didn't have a couple pairs of clothing. In fact, if you look at a lot of places in the world, people typically only have two articles of clothing. I remember when I lived in China, most of my friends had the, the button-up shirt that they wore and then the button-up shirt that was drying for the next day, and they just had two, two shirts. And so that's all they had. And so when we're worried about what we're you know, going to wear, we open up that closet and we go, I don't know which one. You have to shove it over here and there to find out Man, you have a plethora. We all do. And, but, but understand, he, he, God cares for us, and he's going to give this illustration to those that just kind of had, had one outfit. In fact, the outfit was oftentimes passed down from one generation to another. because, And again, only, only the finest people had articles of clothing that had bright colors and, and were dyed with purples and other such things. And he says... This, uh, don't be anxious about your clothing. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory uh, has not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? And he says, O oh, you of little faith. But think about it. You look at the fields out there, you look at flowers, and you go, man, they are amazing. Uh, I mean, you can just see how beautiful they are. And he says, you know what? Solomon, wise and wealthy, he didn't even have anything so great as that. But God cares for them. And how long do these, does this grass that he's talking about, how long is it around? Not that long. In fact, it's there in the field. Somebody goes out, they pick it, they put it in the oven to bake their bread or whatever, and it's gone. But God supplies for, for the lilies of the field and the, and, and the grass, and he's there, and he, and he cares about them. God cares about you. He really does. He cares so deeply about you. And in fact, he, he puts a, Jesus kind of puts a little spin on it at the end. He says, oh, you of little faith. To go around and to say, oh, God doesn't care about me. Just to, to say, I don't have faith that God is good, that he provides. He does care. He does provide. And in fact, uh, let me go ahead and and kind of bring in this passage from John uh, 14, 1 through 3. It says this. Let your hearts, uh, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. So again, he's saying, don't be troubled. Believe in me. Trust in me. I care about you. I have prepared a place for you and it is greater than you can ever imagine. I mean, let's just face it. Your place that you're living in right now, wherever you're living, it's a dump compared 
to what God has for you. I don't care how well you decorate it. It's nothing compared to what our Heavenly Father has prepared for us in heaven. And it's, His call is for us to believe in Him, to believe in God, knowing that He cares for us. But we don't need to be troubled. God has a, an amazing, perfect plan. And that amazing and a perfect plan He has for all who have trusted in Him. In fact, we're called not to be anxious. We're called to completely to follow after Him, not to fall into this idolatrous situation where that we're thinking we can solve all the issues. We can't. God has a place for us. And if He hasn't given us enough arguments yet, He continues on to give us more arguments as why we should not be anxious. So in verse uh, 33 of Matthew 6, it says this, Therefore, do not be anxious. Again, I'm saying it again if you haven't gotten it yet. Saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. So he, he gives a, just a, another example. He expounds upon it. You know, God cares about you. He provides food for you. He knows about them. Look, these that are unbelievers, they, they seek after all these things. They, they, they don't know who God is. But God the Father knows them. He cares about them. How much more He cares about you. The disciples aren't supposed to ask those questions. Like uh, the Gentiles or the pagans would, who don't realize that they have a heavenly Father who knows their needs. So we are supposed to be distinct, unique from those who don't know Jesus. We are supposed to be individuals who say, "Whatever comes, I know that my heavenly Father loves me and cares about me. I will trust in Him." And then it continues on, and in verse 33, it, it, it says this, it says, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Instead of worrying, instead of being anxious, what's our call? Our call is to first... Be about the kingdom of God. And it's, it's interesting, uh, as we've been reading through, most of the time he uh, refers to it as the kingdom of heaven. This is one of the few times he here in the, in the Gospel of Matthew where it talks about the, the kingdom of God. I, I think it adds, uh, in a sense, just kind of this personal aspect of it, that he cares for you. He cares deeply for you. Seek after God. Seek after His righteousness. And all this other stuff, don't worry about it. God will take care of it. He does. He is God. He's created all things. He knows the beginning from the end. And so He's saying, first, this is what I want you to do. I want you to trust in Jesus. And it continues on, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So it says, first seek God, and we'll look at this, we'll look at Philippians uh, 2 a little bit, or in a little bit, but the idea of God is first and foremost. You can't have two masters. You can't have God and money. Put God first. Seek after the things of God, and God will provide. And I think He provides, and when He does provide, He provides in, in, in such a way He even provides through other believers. And then He said, 
there are troubles. He, he gives the reality that there are anxieties. But don't be unduly anxious about any of it. Don't be anxious. Because tomorrow you'll have problems. And you know what? Just as today your Heavenly Father will provide for you, tomorrow your Heavenly Father will provide for you. I mean, how many people, everybody in here could probably say, yeah, I've worried what's going to happen down the road. I'm I worried about, uh, am I going to have enough money? What's going to be there? Am I going to have a job? Am I going to, you know, be able to pay my bills? Am I going to be able to get my car fixed? Am I going to be able to be alive? Um, and we and we take our eyes off Jesus, and we and at the end of it, we realize I really didn't need to worry about it because God faithfully provided. And, and, and again, you know, are there people that have starved to death? Are there people that have had, didn't have enough clothing and they've frozen to death? Yeah, they're there. But does God care for them? Absolutely. God's saying, all right, put me first, foremost, in priority, and, and, and that is the best place to be, knowing that I provide for you. And so, just a couple of different supporting things on this. So Philippians uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 4 through 7. And it says this, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. It says this, this all right, I've told you this. I want to make sure you really hold on to this. I want you to be rejoicing because you have so much to rejoice in. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. That the Lord is at hand. Okay, the Lord is right there. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So what's the solution? When we start to feel anxious, what are we called to do? We're called to go before God in prayer. Again, when we go before God in prayer, what are, what are we essentially saying? God, you hear us. God, you're big enough to take care of it. And that you're overall. It's seeking first the kingdom of God. It's seeking God first. It's putting him in his rightful position. When we go before the Lord in prayer, we can have peace that others can't know because they don't know their Heavenly Father. And in that, there's a supernatural peace that God grants through the Holy Spirit. So it says, guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. So take that up. Take, follow after Jesus. Know that he is there, that he cares, he, he supplies. And then in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, 7 and 8, it says this. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober in mind, be watchful. For your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking some to devour. The enemy's tricks are real. And he uses them again and again and again. God says, be on guard. If you're feeling anxious, know that the enemy is attacking you. Enemy is attacking me. What should I do? I should go before the Lord in prayer. I should put him first in my life, knowing that he cares about me more than I can ever fathom. I'm going to trust in him. I'm not going to make other idols 
but I'm going to keep God in his rightful position as first and foremost in my life. When what you eat, drink, and wear become the primary concern, they become gods, and you make them idols. When other things other than God take the rightful position of where God deserves to be, you make that item an idol. Our hearts are idol factories. Are you okay holding on to idols? I mean, what does Scripture tell us to do with idols? It tells us to have nothing to do with them. In fact, he tells us to break and destroy them. And so that's what our call is, is to be dependent upon God and his provision. To, to trust in him, to trust in the things that he has said through the hard and the difficult times, knowing that God is working for the good of, of those who love him. When I put God first, when you put God first in your life, these other things don't have room to take priority that they don't deserve. The call for us today is to seek God, to have Him first and primary in our lives. Not money, not things, but God. Because there is no benefit, absolutely no benefit, to having other idols in your life. First seek God. Be before Him in prayer. Call out to Him. And for some of you today, you might just need to go ahead, get in your car, drive just a little bit, get out, take a walk, look at the birds, look at the grass, and just, just pray. Hand it over to God. Just say, God, I, I, I have made these idols too long in my life. The things that I'm anxious about and worried about. Cry out loud. Verbalize it. Tell God that you want Him to be first and primary in your life. Tell God that He He cares about you. He knows He cares about you. And say, I'm going to submit to the rule of you in my life. Whatever it takes. I want to live my life for you and for your kingdom and your glory encourage you to take that time and cry out to God. Let's go ahead and go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, uh, we come before you. Oh Lord, we confess that we have sinned, that we have been anxious about things that we should not be anxious about. Oh, Lord, we confess that we have made idols out of things that can't see, can't hear, can't taste. Instead of turning to the living God who cares deeply for us. Oh, Lord, we trust in you. Oh, Lord, we come before you together as a body of believers in prayer, asking for your help, asking for your guidance, because you know you hear us. Oh Lord, I pray that we wouldn't try to have two masters, but we would just serve you who loves us more than more than words could ever express. It's in your holy and precious name we do pray. Amen. All right. Let us continue to worship the Lord as we stand together.
and just sing praises to his name. 